Hi, thanks for joining another Barrel Proof Baseball podcast. Today's guest is Colby Frey from Frey Ranch Distillery. Uh, Colby wears a lot of hats for the distillery. Um, he's a co-founder and president and has a part in distilling and farming, and he does a lot. He wears a lot of hats there. So um, I was really excited to talk to Colby. He is a former uh, Nevada Wolfpack alumni as well, uh, much like myself. So it's always fun to catch up with somebody that has ties to Reno. Uh, Frey Ranch is in Fallon, Nevada, which is an hour east of Reno. Um, so yeah, we had a lot of fun chatting a little bit of uh, Reno times, I guess you'd say. And uh, we have some some common friends who were very helpful in pushing me to get introduced to Colby and and uh, have an opportunity to sit down and talk with him. Their whiskey is outstanding. Their story is outstanding. Um, everything from the grains that they make on their on their ranch, um, they they farm it there. They make the whiskey there, and the first time the whiskey leaves is in a bottle, uh, either being sent out to you know for distribution or with a customer from their their uh, their place there at the distillery. But they're growing their own stuff. They're making their own whiskey. It's a really great story. I really wish them all the success. I really thank them for sending me this bottle because it's definitely one of my favorites. And uh, I'm looking forward to trying some more of their offerings. So check this out. Colby Frey, Frey Ranch Distillery. I hope you enjoy it. Um, Support for the Barrel Proof Baseball Podcast is brought to you by Manscaped. Uh, Manscaped is the absolute best in supporting your men's grooming needs. Manscaped offers precision engineered tools and they obsess over their technology developments to provide you with the very best in men's grooming. Manscaped is trusted by over 2 million men worldwide. As an exclusive offer to my listeners, Manscaped is offering 20% off plus free shipping by using the code BPB at manscaped.com. Now, Manscaped hooked me up with their Perfect Package 3.0 kit. It includes the Lawnmower 3.0 that is waterproof with a built in LED light, their toner. And their, um, oh, it's backwards. And their uh, anti chafing deodorant, as well as a travel kit and some boxers. So uh, check it out. They do a really good job, make a really nice product. Um, 20% off and free shipping by using the code BPB when you visit manscaped.com. It's 20% off, free shipping, manscaped.com with the code BPB. Next, support the channel. Bye becoming a Patreon member. If you click the link in the description box below, you will see a link for Patreon. It's a monthly subscription. Uh, you can get some some swag, right? Some a Glen Karen glass, the Irish whiskey coin, and a bourbon coin. Uh, if you don't want to be a monthly subscriber, you can email me at barrelproofbaseball at yahoo.com, and we can get those things shipped out to you. Uh, next thing you can do is go to the Amazon store in the link uh, in the description below. There's a link for Amazon. Check that out. If you want to buy anything on there, a portion of the proceeds will come to the Barrel Proof Baseball podcast to help pay the bills. So if you'd like that, buy stuff since you'll normally buy stuff on Amazon anyway, just buy it from the Amazon store in my uh, description box below. Last part, check out our friends over at Walk-Offs and Whiskey. They've got a great Instagram page. They've got a great website. They're selling some awesome swag, if you will. Um, They're selling shirts, and man, those guys are doing a nice job. So I'm excited to follow them. I'm excited to watch their releases because they're going to have a really nice following. They're marrying the two best things in the world with baseball and whiskey. So I wish those guys all the luck. Go check them out. I think you're going to like what they're doing. All right. Enjoy today's show. Colby Frey, Frey Ranch Distillery. Thanks so much. Uh, we're here today with Colby Frey, the co-founder and CEO of Frey Ranch uh, Whiskey. Uh, Frey Ranch, you guys are about in Fallon, Nevada, right? Yep. An hour outside of Reno, where yep. uh, I went to school. You went to you went to UNR also, right? I went to UNR. I was there at the same time you were, I think. Yeah, two, I was there two thousand to well, oh four technically. Yeah, I was two two thousand two to two thousand six. So it took me a little okay. longer to get through. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't blame you for uh, sticking around. I love Reno. Yeah. My, my wife lived up there for a while. She went to school there as well. So it's been, uh, it's, it's a fun time to fun place to reminisce about for sure. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Loved it. 
Well, Colby, tell me, uh, tell me a little bit about you, maybe outside of whiskey. Uh, you know, what do you, uh, what do you do? What are you into outside of your, your, your brands, your whiskey, everything? You know, it's, it's funny because, and, and I'm not complaining at all, but like with how much work the whiskey and the ranch and everything is, there's not a lot of time outside of that. You know what I mean? And yeah. which is a good thing actually, because I'm doing what I love. I've always loved whiskey. I've always wanted to be a farmer. And so, um, you know, to be here all the time, we got a little boy that's five years old, just turned five and a little seven-year-old girl. And so pretty much if I'm not working on the farm or working in the distillery, I'm always kind of hanging out with them, you know, but I'm really fortunate because we're doing what we love. So you don't need to do a lot of other stuff, you know? Yeah. That, that makes the work a lot of fun. Yeah, exactly. You, you come from a family of farming, right? Yep. So my family's been farming in Nevada since 1854. Wow. Keep in mind, Nevada didn't even become a state until 1864. So we've been continually farming in Nevada since 10 years before it was even considered a state. They actually own some of the first deeded property in Nevada. And, um, you know, we've, like I said, we've been continually farming ever since. So ever since I was a little boy, I just wanted to be a farmer. It's kind of in my blood. It's just who I always wanted to be. But the problem was we always grew a lot of crops um, and sold them on the open market. We knew, you know, the, the location that we're here in Fallon is about 60 miles east of Reno. All of our water comes from the Sierra Mountains, so both sides of Lake Tahoe, from the Truckee and the Carson Rivers. Um, it goes to the Haunt Reservoir and comes to our farm. And, and we're kind of in this ideal location for growing really high quality crops. And for example, this year we also grew a lot of alfalfa. And all of our alfalfa this year went to China, Dubai, Taiwan, and Japan, because it's such high quality, we can send it around the world. And it's, it's, it's kind of fun for me to, to do that. But with the grain, we've always also grown a lot of grain, wheat, rye, barley, and corn. But the problem is we never really get to experience the final product of any of the crops that we grow. And so my, my other passion has always been whiskey. And we thought, what better way to really showcase the grains and have fun with them than to make them into a whiskey, you know? And so we grow all the grains on the farm. There's wheat, rye, barley, and corn, you can kind of see in this jar, um, that are all grown on the farm in a sustainable way that encourage quality, not necessarily quantity. And so uh, there's a lot of things you can do in the farm to increase the quality of the grains for distilling purposes, but it almost always lowers our quantity. And so by growing it ourselves, we can sacrifice the quantity for quality, which we do on a daily basis. And then we do that with certain fertilizers, for example, if we put certain fertilizers in it, our yield will go way up, but the quality for distilling purposes goes down, which I always got to say distilling purposes, because there's, there's several different uses for grain and it might be better for the cattle market or other areas. And so by growing it ourselves, we ensure that we get really high quality. Uh, we ensure that there's no bad pesticides. They're, you know, they're grown in the right way. And so we're really, uh, you know, the only way to do anything right is really to, to do it yourself to ensure that it's the way that you want it. And with better inputs, you almost always end up with better outputs. And so the better quality grain we can start off with and the better quality whiskey we end up with. And so, um, yeah, we grow all of our own grains and that's kind of our, our basis of who we are. We're farmers plus distillers. How, how much of what you what you farm actually goes into what you use to produce your whiskey? Yeah, so um, right now the farm, we own about 1,500 acres. We farm about 2,500 acres. So we lease some neighboring farms and stuff like that. And to create the whiskey, we need about four to 500 acres, you know, for what we need right now. Mm -hmm. So about a third of the farm that we own is in, in um, grains. And two thirds is in alfalfa, which we, you know, we sell on the open market and all around the world. How did you, I mean, you said you're a fan, but how did you get to that point? It always interests me when I hear about people starting up like distilleries, you go uh -huh. from you're a whiskey fan, you know, you love it. And then you decide that you're going to like, you have the accessibility with your, with your farm right there. But like, how do you go to that point where you finally decide to pull the trigger and like, Hey, this sounds like a good idea. And now we're actually going to do it. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Cause so it, it it actually goes back a long way. So in 2006, we actually got our license to legally start distilling. But the problem was there's no state laws in the state of Nevada. So what we got was an experimental federal license, which allowed us to start making it, aging it, experimenting with it. Um, and what that allowed us to do, um, well, I mean, let me go back. In 2013, we were finally able to get laws passed for the operation of craft distilleries in the state of Nevada. So from 2006 to 2013, what it allowed us to do is 
We played with different varieties of grain, different irrigation management, different fertilizer management, different planting dates, different, um, you know, all on the farm side, but it also allowed us to get our, our grain bills figured out, our mash, like our mashing in process, our um, yeast varieties, you know, if we want to use enzymes, our, we also malt all of our own barley right here on site. And so it's really amazing because from 2006 to 2013, we experimented with hundreds of different varieties of grain and, and lots of different yeast varieties and all these different things. So in 2013, when we knew that we were going to get the loss passed, it, it allowed me to feel really confident in building a really a world-class distillery that we have a continuous still, we have a pot still, um, you know, we're able to produce a, a tremendous a quantity of spirits, but also the quality because we, we didn't just start, you know, from scratch in 2013. We knew, we knew what we wanted and how we wanted to do it. So in 2006, when you pretty much decided then you wanted, that's what you wanted to do. How do you, I mean, did you start making it and, and aging it at that point? Or was it more yeah. from an experimental standpoint? Well, I got to put it in quotes here. 2006 is when we legally started distilling. Okay. You know what I mean? Yes. And, uh, but in 2006, it, we, we built our own stills. And so we really kind of understood the operation of the stills at that point. And it really allowed me to help design. So our stills are designed um, by us and Vendome Copper and Brass. Um, at the time, it's a continuous still with a pot still. And what we do is we strip everything in the continuous still because you can do a lot of quantity in a continuous still. But we always felt like you get better quality in the pot still because you can do a better heads, middle run, and tails cuts and really differentiate those different products inside. And I, I'm sure you're familiar with the heads and the tails and the, 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 uh, the middle run and everything. A little, not, not, not really well. So, so here's the basic principle of distillation is alcohol has a lower boiling point than most liquids. The boiling point of alcohol is 172 degrees. You eat anything with alcohol in it above 172 degrees, the alcohol begins to boil. That boiling alcohol turns into a vapor and you collect that boiling alcohol vapor and that's the spirit that you're collecting out of, you know, whatever you're distilling. So, um, the, the, the nice part about a continuous still is it's really efficient. You're pumping in mash at the top, steam at the bottom. You get out alcohol nonstop because it's a continuous process. You're always pumping in steam, which is heating up the mash and mash, which has alcohol in it and boiling it off. And it's a, you know, it's a very efficient process, but it's really hard to differentiate those different boiling points of the different products. And so what's cool about a pot still is, is, well, let me back up again. There's, toxic things in all alcohol in very small quantities, not enough to really hurt you, but enough to, to affect the quality, which is like, I mean, methanol, acetone, a bunch of these other products that I probably can't even pronounce, you know, and they're in such small quantities, but they almost always have lower boiling points than alcohol. So what we do with the pot stills, we heat it up really slow and we collect all the condensate that comes off first, the distillate, and we throw it away. That's called the heads. And that's all these products with lower boiling points. And then the middle run is all the good stuff that we can actually, we want to keep. It's the good quality stuff. And then the tails towards the end is kind of oily and off flavored. You know, it's this not quality. There's nothing technically wrong with it. It's just not what we want to put in the bottle. And so that we get rid of too. And so with the pot still, we can actually determine those different boiling points and actually separate the product. That's really hard to do with a continuous still. And so that's why we feel like we kind of get the best of both worlds because we have the continuous stills to take our products from like 8%, you know, wort or, or beer at that point, and we strip them to about 40%. Then we put them in the continue or in the pot still and we redistill them in the pot still by taking those cuts. So now instead of putting 8% mash in the pot still, we're able to put 40%, you know, five times more volume per batch in the pot still and get a lot more out of it that way. Is that common practice even for like the big distilleries that are pumping out tons of barrels or is that something that they can, you know, blend more barrels together in their small batch to, you know, create a, a flavor profile they're looking for? You know, everybody kind of has their own thing, but like for us, when, uh, I guess my whole point of, of bringing it up is kind of fun because when we designed it with Vendome Copper and Brass, um, it was, you know, they built hundreds or thousands of continuous stills and hundreds of pot stills but they never really made one where they worked in unison together like this one. And so it was really kind of cool. A couple of months later, we saw an ad, uh, uh, an article written on Vendome and they had a picture of our actual still, you know, kind of saying this is the best type of still for a mid-sized distillery. 
And it was really kind of cool because it was our, you know, we were the first one to, to actually get them to, to build it like that. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, having your own kind of unique way of doing it. And, and yeah. that's a, it's a big company. I know they're, they're widely used. It's really cool. Yeah. Now yeah. You guys, oh, they're, and they're great. You guys do other spirits as well, right? Yeah. So uh, we used to do like a vodkas and, and uh, gins, which were really good and other spirits, but we've phased all those out. We kind of tell everybody it's the truth. We've always thought of ourselves as a whiskey distillery and the other stuff just gave us something to do while we we're waiting for the whiskey to age. Cause our whole plan from the beginning is we wouldn't release anything less than four years old. Um, the, the whiskey that you're trying right now is an average of five years old. There's some that's a little bit less and some that's a little bit more like 4.7 to 5.2, I think. Um, and, uh, but we didn't want to release anything before it's time. And so that the other, other products gave us something to do. We discontinue them all. We have a few left to sell here at the distillery, but when they're gone, they're gone. We'll never make them again. Oh, nice. Yeah. Just go, go right to the whiskey, man. Yeah. I have to, I have to imagine that's way more fun to go through that process of making it than, you know, vodka or gin. It is. And, and people ask us all the time, like, how did you wait five years before you bottled it? And my answer is always, I got to taste it like anytime I wanted throughout the whole process. So it wasn't that hard to wait for me. <laughs> well, and I'm, I'm sure too, like having the availability of your farm is probably a little bit different than other companies that are trying to start out their own, their own brand and have to, you know, source things or, you know, go through like an MGP or something like that, where, where yeah. you guys can do it. And like you said, you have the other spirits and you've got your farming business going as well. Yeah. And so like, and, 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 People have asked, like, why didn't we go to MGP and get it, you know, start off with some of their product to get started off? And that's, I, there's nothing wrong with that. Let me back, let me say that up front. I mean, there's lots of distilleries that do that. And I think that there's a lot of really good whiskey that, yeah. that does that. But um, for us, we're trying to showcase our, our grains. And so we can't take somebody else's whiskey that they made from a different state and put it in our bottle with a good conscience. You know what I mean? And sure. so this is our way to really showcase the grains that we grow right here on the farm. So we had to wait for our whiskey to age. And then the other thing is too, is that our, our distillery is right here on our farm. That's right next to my house that I want to pass this farm on to my kids. And so we can't screw it up. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's gotta be, good. We got to wait the full time. We can't, we can't, um, you know, we can't just sell it or we can't just walk away. It's like, this is our, our life right here. And so we really had to do it right the first time. Yeah. Your name's going on that bottle. Literally. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's not, I, I, I'm with you. I don't, I don't know how that in that scenario, I think it'd be difficult to try and source whiskey, which again, like you said, it's good, but you're not showcasing the grains and what you guys have available to you. I mean, that's, that's yeah. an awesome way to look at it. I think. Thank you. And, and so you're going with, I mean, I don't know if people really pay that much attention to it as, as they should, but I mean, to go with a straight bourbon, you know, connotation on, on the label, it has to be labeled. It has to be aged, you know, with no age statement, it's going to be aged four years, right? Yep. Yep. So yep. I mean, you're getting your, your aging done, you know, appropriately with the, uh, with the bottles you're putting out. Yep. And that was from the beginning. We said, we will not release any whiskey less than four years old. It ended up being about five years old, even though it was really good at four. Um, we waited till five because we started working on the packaging and we thought we would use what they call a stock bottle. It's just a bottle that everybody can use, you know, make a fancy label out of it or whatever. And we just couldn't, we couldn't get behind any of the bottles. And so we went through the, the custom glass process, which takes a long time, but that was okay for us because we didn't, just like I said, we can't, we can't screw it up. We got to get it right the first time. And so we really um, went through the whole packaging process. My wife had a lot to do with it. Um, you got a bottle there, don't you? Yeah, this, this so, might be the coolest bottle out there. This thing's heavy duty. Yeah, so it's, it's a really heavy, um, a huge amount of glass in it. Yeah. Um, if you look at the topper, we kind of went through like it's, it's metal. It's all recycled metal, but it's a metal topper. Uh -huh. It kind of looks like a bolt. And my wife always tells everybody like, I wanted to find something that you just find here on the farm, you know? And uh, I find bolts and nuts and that kind of stuff in Colby's pockets all the time, you know, and so yeah. just something you'd shove up there. And then if you look at the label, it's supposed to look like without being too farmy ranchy, I, I have a belt buckle that my grandpa gave to my dad and then my dad gave to me that I wear all the time. And uh, it's kind of like my belt buckle, you know, without being a, you know, wraps all the way around the bottle. Yeah. And then if you look at this, let me show you. So here's an ear of corn from the field. And we wanted the label to kind of represent the yellow corn off the field, you know? Oh, nice. And uh, 
That then I don't know if you noticed. If you look at the bottom, have you seen the bottom yet? I didn't. It says around the bottom, "Be good to the land, and the land will be good to you." Yeah. And it's kind of like the foundation of us as a farm. Like I, I'm really fortunate. My grandpa gave this farm to my dad in beautiful condition, and he, my dad gave it to me, amazing. And I want to give it to my kid as, kids as as good or better condition than I received it in. And so it's like, if you be good to the land, and the land will be good to you. And it's kind of our foundation on the farm and, and on the bottle, because if we take without giving back, we don't have a future as farmers. And so um, it's really important to us. No, I think, I think it's great. I think, I mean, yeah, every time you see this bottle and, and you lift the lid off of it and it's heavy duty, like that's, that's no joke. It's no piece of plastic sitting up there. I just talked to a, a girl that worked at a bar and she, she pulled the top off and dropped it behind the the bar and ship the tile that yeah. <laughs> the, the tile underneath that she was kind of cussing it a little bit, but also liked it, you know? <laughs> yeah. I think it's awesome. It, it, it looks so nice. I mean, everything about it looks like there's definitely detail put into it and it's not just a generic bottle. I mean, it's special. And he said, say coming from a special place on your, your family's farm. And that's awesome. Thank you. Now, do you, so your, your yield like annually, is that something that, like, do you have stuff in reserve that if you sell out quickly, because the popularity of it from everything I've heard about is, is starting to really blow up and people are really excited about it. Is that something that like you have your annual yield and once that's out, it's out and you got to wait till next year to get it? Pretty much. Um, but then what we're trying to do is we're trying to do a good job at where we're at. So we're only available in Nevada and California right now. And, and literally like Southern California within the next like week, you know, like we're just launching in Southern California. Um, We've been in Northern California a little bit, but we want to do a good job at where we're at. So people can get it shipped to them around the country from retailers that might sell it online or whatever. But uh, every year we increased our production. And as we can increase our production, we're, we'll increase our states. But yes, when we run out, we run out. It's not like we're not buying from MGP or, or a place like that that might have thousands of barrels extra that they, you could maybe buy if you, if you need more, you know? And so... Um, Last year, we're really fortunate that we actually met all of our sales goals, even with COVID, which is is kind of cool. And our, on our launch year, we launched in Las Vegas last year in February. It was amazing. We were in 260 on-premise locations. So that's bars and restaurants in one month. And then they all got shut down the next month. And so we were kind of scrambling like, oh, man, what are we going to do? You know, because we were trying to keep supply for those on-premise places. And, and as unfortunate as they got shut down, we're, we're also... Uh, you know, our, our inventory was hurting. So we, we uh, kind of re-evaluated re everything and started with off-premise, which is like, you know, when you consume it off-premise, grocery stores and, and liquor stores. And, and we were really fortunate that, that they really came through for us and, and got us back to where we wanted to be. You guys had a really good year in 2020. I saw you have, you, you won a number of, uh, of awards from some different places on, uh, was it this, the straight bourbon and then the rye also? Yeah, the rye. So that's that's the rye, and uh, it won a bunch of awards too. And, it, and the, my favorite award, and it was the coolest, um, just advertisement that I've seen is the rye got uh, top ten whiskeys in the Whiskey Advocate Fall 2020 catalog, and it said our their advertisement on Facebook said our top ten whiskeys hail from Kentucky, Tennessee, Nevada. Scotland and Ireland. And I thought, how cool is that to have Nevada yeah. mentioned with Kentucky, Tennessee, Scotland, and Ireland, you know, like Seriously. I was that, that, that was just that part right there was really cool to me. Yeah. That's, that, that'll stand out for sure. That's awesome, man. That's <laughs> so cool. Now you guys, so you, you're doing, you're doing everything there. Like you're growing the crops yeah. there. You're like you said, you're malting it there. So without getting, I mean, you don't have to get all science on it, but you're going from getting the crops and then what is that process like between, you know, going from crops to getting it into the bottle? Yeah. So, I mean, um, first, I mean, it's so much more than just either buying grain or, or buying whiskey because we have to start with like seed selection at the very first, you know, mm -hmm. and then we have to figure out which fields we want to plant it in because we're rotating our crops. You don't want to just grow one crop in one field constantly, you know, so it's all this planning before you can even uh, plant your crops, you know, and then we take soil tests. And then we also put, before we plant the, the crops, it's kind of cool because in the distillery, all of our solid byproducts that come off the stills go to the dairy that's right next door. Our property butts up next to their property. And then the dairy produces a lot of manure. The manure is the best fertilizer that you can get. 
You know, it's, it's got every nutrient that that plant needs in it. So we mm. spread that on the field before we grow the next crop. So we don't have to buy any commercial fertilizers or anything like that and ship them in from really around the world. A lot of commercial fertilizer comes from overseas. And anyway, so, um, so it starts off with that, that kind of planning. You know, then we, once we know what types of, of, even the seed selection, there's different varieties of each seed, you know, so we plant the seed, then we have to do our irrigation management. Um, you know, you test it periodically for all kinds of different, like maybe it's lacking certain nutrients and things like that. We take tissue tests. Um, then uh, we harvest it, we store it um, right here in silos. So we get it, we got to make sure we harvest it at a really low moisture. So it stores well inside the silos. Um, then we mill it right here on site. We uh, mash it in, uh, so we cook it. So, um, and, and in the meantime, if it's barley, we malt all of our own barley here on site. Uh, we mash it in, which is really important for the conversion of the starches and the grains to sugar. If we, you know, really get down into it, we ferment it, distill it, age it, filter it, which we don't cold filter it, but we just rough filter it just for any sediment, but no cold filtration, because that takes out a lot of the flavors wow. that we just spent five five plus years to get and then bottle it all right here on our site so it's kind of cool because um ashley my wife tells everybody when when she she works in the tasting room every saturday we're open from noon to four in the tasting room and she tells everybody none of the ingredients have ever left our possession until you take them home so like from our, our trademark is called from ground to glass we have total control of everything from the ground to the glass i mean I can see why you take so much pride in it. Like I keep I, I'm thinking about this in my head, like the detail that you put into the bottle, like every little thing about it. I mean, when you're literally like, you're talking about the seeds and I mean, that's, it really is incredible. I mean, whereas other companies, like they're focused on where am I going to go get these grains from or, or whatever, like you're actually doing it yourself. Like, I think that's a really, really cool, unique thing that it's probably not, I have to imagine it's not done very often in whiskey. Well, there, there's very few that do everything and there's there's a few farm distilleries but they might grow they might grow the corn but they buy the malt or you know they they buy certain ones but from the beginning we said we want a hundred percent whiskey from us and to do that we got to make our own we got to malt our own barley and even though like honestly we could probably buy the malted barley cheaper than we could even make it for ourselves grow it and make it you know but um but that's not who we are we want our product in there do you, do you spend more of your time in the, the farming side of things or the, uh, the whiskey side of things? What it's the best in the, in the world, because in the spring I'm heavy on the farm, you know, in the winter I'm heavy in the distillery in the middle of the summer, it's probably 50, 50, cause we're, we're maintaining all the crops, but we're not planting or harvesting or anything in the fall. It's probably heavy on the farm, you know, and then the, like I said, the winter is usually a lot in the distillery, you know? And so it's kind of fun because it's never, never boring it's never the same right. thing all the time and so i don't i don't it's not really heavy on one or the other all year round it's it's really seasonal um but we got a great team in the distillery that can run the distillery while i'm working on the farm i got a great farm team also but uh it's it's really fun for me with, with uh i mean i think people are generally i hate to say it most people but a lot of people are, are unfamiliar with northern nevada yeah. Um, you know, they think Nevada and it's Vegas. I mean, I don't even know if I knew where Reno was before I went to school up there. Um, but there's, you know, weather in Northern Nevada is definitely, uh, it can be a little brutal. Yeah. What are, what, besides that, like, what are some challenges that you guys have that may be unique to like what you're doing versus maybe some other areas that are distilling? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I'm sure you've been to Kentucky and they'll talk about how important the four seasons are for aging yeah. whiskey. Yeah. You know, and inside the barrel, it expands during those hot winters and it contracts during cold, or hot winters, sorry, hot summers and it contracts during the cold winters, you know, and so it's that expansion and contraction is really important. Me and my wife just laughed every time they said that because we're from northern Nevada and sometimes we have all four seasons in one day. You yeah. know, you, you've you been here and, and experienced oh, yeah. that, I'm sure. And uh, so that's really important that we have that and it gets down to zero degrees here in the coldest part of the winter. And, and it gets up to 100 plus degrees in the hottest part of the summer. And so we're, we really do have that, that expansion and contraction. Now, the one thing that we're lacking for that is humidity. Now, humidity is really important to keep the wood from drying out. And there's a lot of, of really science that goes into why humidity actually makes a better quality product also. And so in our barrel warehouses, they're unheated, they're unair conditioned, 
but they're humidified. So we have a really expensive humidification system that keeps them nice and humid. So we don't lose a lot to the angel share, but also at high humidity, you actually lose more alcohol than water. At low humidity, you lose more water than alcohol. So at low humidity, we would lose more water, which means the proof would actually go up in the barrel, which is bad because then we'd have to add more water to get it to 90 proof, you know? So now we have a more diluted, less concentrated, less flavorful product. So it's really important that we add that humidity in the barrel warehouse um, to make a better quality product and then also to not lose as much to the angel share. So the other, um, the other benefit though to lack of humidity is there's a lot of reasons why I feel like the lack of humidity is actually better for the growing and the farm side of it because we have a reservoir where we get all of our water. So we irrigate when it needs it. Not, we're not relying on mother nature, which is feast or famine. You get too much water, not enough water. But also, um, we don't have a lot of humidity where we can get the grains to dry down in the fields naturally rather than um, either having to use them fast because they're, they're, there's too much moisture in them. They might mold. They don't store well when there's, there's higher humidity in them. Or there's big dryers that use a tremendous amount of electricity or uh, propane, actually, to, to dry the grains to get the, the humidity out. But what's really cool about it is, I mean, whiskey traditionally was a way that farmers could store their grain longer, you know? And so if you think about it, there wasn't a lot of distilleries out west here because we can actually get the grain to dry down naturally in the field without the dehydrators. Whereas in places like Kentucky, they have a lot of humidity. And so their grain wouldn't dry, right? You know, they couldn't store it for extended periods of time. So they'd make it into whiskey. And so um, that's a big reason why you see a lot of whiskey in, in the areas like Kentucky and Tennessee. I, I didn't know that. I, I didn't know that about humidity. I'd never heard that before. Yeah. Because I know the heat and the cold is going to affect, you know, the barrel and, and the whiskey absorption and everything like that. But I mean, that makes perfect sense because you can get, you'll get some hundred degree days in, in Northern Nevada fairly yeah. early in the year. And then you can get a random snow and, and even in like October, yeah. you know, it's the same thing. It can stay warm. And, but the, yeah, the, it just never gets very humid. Yeah. And it doesn't, you know, what's crazy is like, you'll, you'll come here and it'll be 105 degrees outside. You'll walk in the barrel house and you look at the thermometer and it's only 90, 95, whatever in the barrel house. Cause it's a little behind, you know, and, uh, it's just hard to breathe in there because all the humidity and you go back outside you're like man it's way cooler outside yeah. even though it's 10 15 degrees hotter outside but that lack of humidity really uh, makes it a lot more bearable to to withstand you know yeah, i remember i remember shoveling snow off of the baseball field so that we could play in you know march or whatever it was and then by game time you're in sh like short sleeve shirts and you're, you know you're bundled up shoveling snow and it's icy and just gross and you know, it's beautiful by the time you get to game time. It was awesome. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, so we're, we're in what they call the high desert. And so that we have really dis ex extreme differences between day and night also. And what that does also a lot with the plants is allows them to breed during the really cool nights, but grow during the hot days. And so it's really kind of an ideal growing condition for the plants too. But it's just like that. It'll, it'll snow at night. It'll be 30 degrees and, and it'll go up to 65, 70 during the day and everything's melted or a lot of times we'll get a, a rainstorm or a little snowstorm here in the morning. And by, by noon, it's dusty again. You know, it's crazy. Yeah. It just dries yeah. right out. Yeah. That Northern, that Northern Nevada weather is no joke. If people yeah. haven't been up there. It's, it's definitely uh it's unique to say the yeah. least. How, yeah. how, so when you talk about like the humidity and, and getting it to 90 proof, is that something that was important? Is that, did you want specifically to get this to 90 proof as the, as the straight bourbon? Yeah. And we, we definitely wanted it. So if you don't cold filter it, you want it to be above 88 proof usually. Um, and we tasted it every proof and it was really crazy how much different it tasted at like 92, 94, 96, 98. And our favorites was 90 and hundred. And we wanted to do it at 90 just because we wanted something for the people that might not mm -hmm. care for the higher proof bourbons, you know, but then we did our rye whiskey is bottled and bonded at hundred proof, you know, mm -hmm. and then we also do our single barrels. So we do single barrel store picks and those are barrel proof. And so those are 120 something proof a lot of the time. So uh, we kind of wanted the 90 for, for just the, that, that um, you know, that different variety of people. Yeah. I see a lot of, a lot of people coming out with like that 80 proof. And for me personally, uh, you know, I'm not like the proof snob. I don't, it doesn't need to be, you know, as high as humanly possible, but um, most 80 proofs that are out of like big distilleries, 
uh, just it doesn't it really doesn't do it for me. I think that 90 is like a really nice, sweet spot for people that, like you said, don't want to go super high in proof, but don't necessarily want just that entry level 80 proof that is, you know, can be like carameled down to be too sweet, really. Yeah. And that's what I always said. I did. I never wanted to make an 80 proof. So 90 proof is pretty much our floor of where we'd ever bottle anything. Okay. So let's, let's talk about some of those bottles. I want to, I definitely want to yeah. open this thing up. The, so is the, is the, the barrel proof, is that typically at, this one's 132. Is that typically <laughs> what you're at? Pretty much our highest barrel we ever did. So normal, also our 120 to 126. Mm -hmm. um, that was one of the single barrels that we had here at the ranch. That was, I think, 170, barrel number 174. Um, and uh, it's, it's, yeah, that's, that's a high proof one. But you know what's crazy? A lot of times when we do these barrel picks, we actually just did one, uh, two of them actually this morning. And uh, we'll offer like six different barrels to the stores. And I find it ironic how a higher proof one, like the 132 proof one you have, typically doesn't taste as hot as the 120 proof one or the 125 proof one. And I don't, I don't know what it is about it, but I've, I've always noticed that when we do these barrel picks. I was laughing. I, I had posted a picture on uh, social media of my excitement to you know chat with you. And so I post a picture of, of the, the bourbon, this is the straight bourbon. And, you know, I get a response with a, a picture of um, the barrel proof where somebody, I guess they had like a, I think it was a Las Vegas club or something like yeah. that. They did a, a single barrel and I was like, yeah, I, I got a little sample of it, but I want to, yeah, I want to try that out because some of those yeah, are really so interesting. Did they have a, a special sticker on it or something like that? I got to look. I don't remember. I, yeah. I, I'll, I'll look at the picture and I'll let it's you know. Funny. Yeah. Now. All right. So, so the. Just the straight bourbon. Tell me a little bit about this. So it's 90 proof. It's aged at least four years. Um, yep. I've got batch two here. Um, yeah. Tell me a little bit about this, like some tasty yeah. notes. Or... So it's four grains. So it's wheat, rye, barley, and corn. And so yeah, I'm sure you, you're familiar with it. Bourbon has to be 51% or more corn. So they all have mostly a majority corn in the mash bills. But most bourbons are barley and rye. So they're, they're corn, barley, and, and rye. And then some there's weeded bourbons like your maker's mark, you know, is corn, barley, and wheat. And this one has wheat and rye because rye is traditionally a really spicy grain. And wheat is typically like a kind of a subtle grain, but I also feel like wheat contributes a lot to the mouthfeel. So you get that little bit of creamy texture from the wheat when you taste the four grain bourbon, you get a little bit of spice from the rye, and then you get a little bit of sweetness from the corn. And so it's a four grain, it's 66% uh, corn, it's 10% wheat, 11% rye, and 12% two row malted barley that was malted right here on site. So there's two row and there's six row malted barley. Are you familiar with that? No, I've never heard of those. So two row malted barley, it's when it's growing on the plant, there's two rows growing at the, the where the seed pod grows at the top. Six row has six rows. Six rows traditionally gets a lot more yield. There's a lot more, you know, uh, growing up there on the top of the, the plant there. But the problem is there's two rows on the six row that's really plump and big. And then there's four rows of kind of smaller little grain, you know? And so the problem with that is, is when we're malting it, they all germinate differently because they're all different size seeds. And so we grow two row barley because typically it's better quality for malting purposes because the, usually the, the grain is all a more even consistent size. So when we germinate it and, and malt it, malting is basically germinating the plant and it's, it's a lot more consistent and easier to work with in the malt house. So even though the yield is a lot less, we still like two row malting barley. There, it's funny. I've, I've talked to a couple of other, you know, craft distilleries or, or smaller distilleries that are, you know, getting themselves going and, and have done fairly well for themselves. And it seems like something that's very common amongst you know, like a smaller distillery that's not mass producing bourbon is the four is the four grain mash bill versus yeah. a lot that are, that are three grain. And I was just, I, I'm always curious about that, but I always, but your explanation of using the wheat for that mouthfeel, the rye for the spice. I mean, I think it makes perfect sense. Yeah. And we just, we, and we've always grown on the farm here. We've always grown wheat, rye, barley, and corn. And it's really funny because the rye that we've always grown here is the same variety. So when, when we started researching, like what should we grow for distilling purposes, you know, and we, we looked into it and we found out the varieties that they grow in Canada and Germany and all these other places that grow a lot of rye. And it's the same variety that we'd have been growing on the farm for the last 50, 60, 70, whatever years since we started growing that variety. And so 
Um, it was kind of fun for us. And, uh, and same with wheat. I mean, we've always grown a, a soft white winter wheat and that's the same variety that we put in the, the, you know, the, the, uh, the whiskey. And so it's really hard to decide between the two. And then we, what we did is we distilled each one a hundred percent by themselves. Mm -hmm. So we did a hundred percent wheat, a hundred percent rye, hundred percent barley, hundred percent corn. And that allowed us to taste what each different grain was contributing to the final product. So now it's when I taste the four grain, I really can say like, yeah, that's contributing that flavor. I can taste the, the little bit of spice from the rye and the, the subtle mouthfeel and creaminess from the wheat. So it's kind of, it's really fun. I like, I, I really like the amount of rye that's like, you get that spice from the rye for sure. I think it's perfect because I think sometimes, you know, like the 80 proof ones, you know, like a basil Hayden's, they, they try and over rye it to make up for the lack of proof, you know? So it's just a, it's like spicy caramel and it's not really good. Like this gives you a nice amount of spice um, along with that really nice mouthfeel. Like you said, from that wheat, I, I really like that one. Thank you. Um, I don't have the rye. Let's talk about, tell me about the I, rye. Now, I should have, what, I'm sorry. I should have sent you the rye. I didn't realize I didn't. Hey, I'll, I'll find it. I'm going to buy it, man. This stuff is outstanding. I really enjoy it. <laughs> I'm not just saying that. So. Yeah. So the rye is a hundred percent rye, which is a giant pain in the ass when you're bought, when you're making it. Um, but it's super fun because just like I said, I fell in love with the rye all by itself. And so by putting something else in it, it takes away some of the flavor. Or you're wondering like, is that flavor coming from something else? And so it's 100% rye. It's bottled in bond, which you're, are you familiar with the, the rules yeah. of bottled in bond? 100 so proof, uh, aged four years. Yep. Distilled in the same season, mm -hmm. distilling season. So it's kind of a funny story. We released batch one and batch two at the same time mm -hmm. because... We distilled our first few batches that we're going to blend together. This is like distilling batches, but we, we, we have our batches are usually several batches. And um, our first batch of rye happened to be at the end of June. Mm -hmm. And then our, our next batches were at the beginning of July. Well, the distilling season just happens to be January 1st till the end of June and then July till the end of December. So we had to, we actually had to bottle them, even though they were literally days apart in, in fermentation and they're actually pretty much put in the barrel almost this, I mean, within days. And, uh, but because of that, we had to, to bottle it as batch one and batch two. Wow. But you got to keep it for the, uh, for the bottled and bond reference. Yeah. That's, bottled that and bond. Sense. So because we did that, we had to have two different batches. Now, how, how old is the rye? How long is that aged? It's all five years or more. So we can okay. actually, so we actually put aged five years on the label. We could put okay. it, you know, nice. Um, okay. And then the, the barrel proof, cause this is the one yeah. I'm ready to jump into yeah. here. So it's just barrel proofs. And what we do is when we, when we take our next batch of barrels, we get them all in a line, we taste all of them. We kick out the ones that are special for different reasons. So they might be, they're all different and it's amazing how different they all are. So like one might be really creamy. One might have a little bit of spicy or one might be caramel or one might be really earthy or whatever. We kick it aside. And then we offer it to stores for like their store picks, you know? And so all of our single barrels are barrel proof store pick um, and single barrels. And so uh, do you do a store pick with your, with the straight bourbon or just the single barrel or just the, just, uh, the barrel proof, just the barrel proof single barrel right now. And so, um, and so that's, what's fun. And it's really fun to taste through them with the stores because it's amazing the different flavors in each one. And so we taste them with them and it's really fun. I get, I get a lot of caramel on the nose with this one. Is that crazy? It's, yeah. Yeah. And then there, there's that rye spice. Is it the same mash bill as the straight bourbon? See, yeah. Everything's the same exact mash bill. And, uh, yeah, that, that would have came out of the same, same barrel, same everything. Just not, not proof down from there. Not proof down from there. And it's, it's special in its own way. So like, None of the barrels that we've ever tasted, we taste every one of them to make sure none of them are bad in any way. We don't want to blend it, but we haven't had any that are, you know, that are necessarily bad, but they, they might just be just a normal bourbon or they might be a good, you know, just a, a good bourbon, but they're not special in their own way. Mm. And so that's why we kicked those out. That one's one of our distillers pick that we sold here in the tasting room. That, that's really, really nice. That doesn't taste yeah. like 132 proof by any means. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? 130. Yeah. 132. Yeah, yeah. That's not, that doesn't, cause there's some, uh, not naming names, but there are some barrel proofs that are a little popular at the moment and they definitely come off a lot hotter than that with the proof, yeah. not, not the rye, but just the proof itself. Yeah. 
No, and that's and that's that's what that's what I was saying. Like those higher proof ones always seem to be really really creamy and buttery, mm -hmm. but you taste a little bit of the cream in the mouthfeel, and yeah, yeah, it lingers really nicely. That doesn't that doesn't go away. That's one of the things too. I think with the four grain mash bill, you have a really good finish on it, and so to me, the finish is just as important as the rest of the the tasting. You know, if you if you taste it and it tastes fabulous, and then all of a sudden you get a, a bad aftertaste or finish, yeah. it doesn't make you want to drink it again. But sure. when you get a really good finish, it just want, makes you want to come back to it and drink more. Um, now, is there is there any other um, have you have you dabbled at all with any like finishings or anything like that? Yeah, so we've never done any like special finishes. So because like uh, if we did like a wine barrel finish or a, the sherry finish or something like that, it's almost like we're covering up the grains even more, you know. And so our, our idea was to showcase the grains. But what we ha we have done, we have we make eighty percent bourbon, fifteen percent rye, and then five percent other stuff. And we always it's it's the truth. We say it's five percent of our production, but ninety percent of our fun. You know, and so we've made, like I said, 100% corn, 100% barley, 100% wheat, 100% rye. We've also made 100% oat. Wow. We've made a five grain bourbon with oats. We've made a four grain where we replace the wheat with oats. We've made a four grain bourbon where we replace the rye with oats. Um, we've made a single malt, so like 100% malted um, barley, so like an, almost an Irish style whiskey. Yeah. And then we've made smoked single malts where we took our own corn. So you know, peat is just like decomposed plant matters from years and just in these bogs and they dig it out and they burn it, you know. Well, what we did is we decomposed a bunch of corn stalks and we pressed it. We, we got this powder that comes off the, the mill. It's almost like a flour, mixed it with water and then mixed it with the, the decomposed corn stalks, pressed it in bread pans and then smoked our barley with that to make like a scotch style you know, from the ranch here where we can actually, the, even the peat is from, you know, it's not peat, but you know, the peat yeah. substitute is from the ranch. Um, we've done a smoked rye and oat, which is going to be really good. I think we did a quad malt where we took our bourbon recipe and which is wheat, rye, barley, and corn did the same ratios, but everything's malted. So the corn's malted, the rye's oh. malted, the barley's malted, and the wheat is malted. And we call that our quad malt, which is really fun because it's crazy how much different it tastes because we literally put whiskey in the barrel the day before. It's our traditional, our, our normal mash bill with just, you know, normal corn, rye, and wheat. And then the next day we made this quad malt and we taste them side by side. And it's amazing how different it is. It's almost like you're drinking like my, it's almost like you're drinking like Splenda the sweetener. You know what I mean? It's wow. crazy. Like how, how like the mouthfeel and everything's like just lingers. Um, we have so many fun things like that, that, that are on the way. The other fun thing that we did is, is we did a lot of 100% wheat, 100% rye, 100% bar, malted barley, 100% corn. And what I'd like to do someday is, you know, they have store picks, you know, like, like we do with our single barrels. I'd like to do a store blend where you send like a vial of wheat, rye, barley, and corn and say, you guys figure out what you want your, your mash bill to be and we'll blend it and send it to you, you know, and it could be, it could be a secret. It could be advertise whatever you want you know what i mean it'd be kind of fun to do that kind that'd of stuff be, yeah that'd be really cool i think you'd have people fighting to do that because yeah. i mean like you know you get to start your own uh your own bottle you know so to say so to speak i mean it's you're, you're coming up with the, the the blend of it i think that'd be a lot of fun yeah they have something to do with the final product whereas yeah. you know like our barrel picks are super fun and they're they're cool but you're picking you're picking one you're not really deciding the final yeah. product you know what i mean how, how much, how much like creative control, so to speak, do you have, or is that something that you come in and go, Hey guys, like, I want to try this out. Or does your, your, you know, master distiller come to you and say, Hey, you know, let's, let's try this. Or is this a, uh, a collaborative thing? Like, how does that work? Well, I mean, it, it goes both ways. I mean, I have ideas all the time and he has ID, great ideas all the time too. And so it's kind of fun. And we just bounce them off of each other and then, and then do it. And that's, what's fun is we're not you know, big distilleries, I think, have a problem like doing kind of off the wall, wacky stuff, whereas we could just say, yeah, we're going to we're going to do oats. And that's oats are kind of a fun thing because they're a little bit different. But the problem with oats are when you grow them in the field, they're 60 percent holes. Now, a hole is like the protective coating that's around the, the actual grain, you know, mm -hmm. and so it's like a protective sheet. Right. And they're a giant nuisance in the distillery. They're giant. I mean, they're just it, it's really hard because. 
They just cause problems in the stills. They cause problems in the fermentation tanks, everything. And so we actually found a variety of oats called naked oats or nude oats, and they don't have this hole. And so we actually had to have them shipped in from Canada and we planted them. And now we have this holeless oats that we can actually manage in the distillery properly, but grow them ourselves. And they're actually turning out to be really good. So it's, it's kind of fun to grow our own grains because we can do that kind of stuff. Whereas sure. we couldn't even find, I mean, seed in the United States that we had, we had to have it shipped in from Canada that, that are holeless oats. And, and now we're kind of having fun playing around with those. That's amazing. It's gotta be, that's gotta be so much fun. Just sitting there going, Hey, let's give this a try and see how it turns out. And yeah, I mean, I, I, that's so cool. Yeah. And so I'm, we're really fortunate because our distiller is also a certified crop consultant. And so he really understands the growing side, but also the distilling side. And so he helped us find this variety in Canada and, and just totally like geeks out with me on that kind of stuff. And, uh, but, but gets, makes it happen, you know? Yeah. That's awesome, man. I, I think it'd be so much fun to like, just sit back and go, Hey, let's just try this. I mean, who knows if it's going to be any good, but like it might be, and it might be something new and awesome. And, and like what you were saying about the, the, the finishes, I think it's really interesting. Like it, it would really, I think it would freak me out a little bit if I was going to take good bourbon, like if I was to take the, the straight bourbon and put that into a, you know, a port barrel or something like that, that would kind of freak me out a little bit going, man, am I ruining good yeah. bourbon? Like bourbon that's yeah. good enough already to, to add something that may or may not be good. Like if your finishing time is too short, too long, I mean, you just ruin good bourbon, but yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. No. And, and it, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I don't want to yeah. knock people that put it. I mean, it's, no, there's no. a lot of good bourbons that are, are finished, but for us, it just, it, it masks our flavor of the grains and the, the actual flavor. And we're already, you know, wood obviously is a big flavor. And so we don't want to mask the wood and the grain flavor we've already, we've already created. Yeah, no, it makes total sense. Now in, in terms of, um, like you said, you guys are going to Southern California shortly. Yeah. yeah. Any, any other expansion into some areas that people that should be aware of? Not, not this year. So this year we're just really trying to concentrate on California. And then next year we really haven't decided where we're going to go next. And so, um, anticipate it'll probably be like Texas, Chicago, Florida, New York, but we're not, we're not quite sure, but we got a lot of production in the, in the future, but for now we're running pretty short. So that's why we kind of want to keep it, keep it slow and steady. No, I, I believe it. I, I mean, I could, if I, if I can advocate for, you know, West Phoenix, then I'll, um, I'll, I'll throw my, my name yeah. in the hat for the advocation for that. But luckily my, my wife's from Vegas, so we get back there enough. So, um, you know, trying to find it there, it shouldn't be too much of a problem. Yeah. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, <laughs> um, you can order it online. You mentioned. Yeah. So there's four retailers that can order it online. We're working on, a, on an online um, ordering platform. You know, as you know, the, the problem with liquor is, is that there's a lot of different laws. Every state yeah. has their own set of laws. And so right now we can't legally ship it from the state of Nevada. And so if you go to our website, there's four retailers that um, you can mm. ship to. Some of them can ship to certain states, and but not others. And so you kind of have to, it's a little bit clunky, but it, it works. It happens. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I, uh, I've, I've definitely sent some balsamic vinaigrette places, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, out of necessity from time to time. Yeah. That's what's uh, wild. If somebody comes to the distillery and buys it, they can legally ship it to somebody else, but we can't ship it to that same person. You know what I mean? Crazy. And yeah. didn't Kentucky just passed a house bill that, that yeah. they can now ship from distilleries, but yeah, I, I don't know. I don't make the rules. Yeah. Uh, social media, where can, where can people find you guys? Yeah. So I think it's just, oh man, just Frey Ranch. I think we're at Frey Ranch Distillery. Um, and uh, we're on uh, Twitter. We're on, uh, oh my gosh, I can't even, we're on Facebook, of course, and, and Twitter and Instagram. Okay. Well, yeah. I really appreciate your time today. It was fun. I think I told you before we got started, the amount of people that had reached out and said that, uh, you know, I need to, need to break it down with you a little bit was, was crazy. I think uh, Jay Kenny tagged you in something and said, I need yeah. to talk to you. And um, I had a couple other buddies that, that said the same thing. So I, I really appreciate your time. And, and this is awesome. And I, I cannot push enough for people to buy Frey Ranch whiskey. This stuff is awesome. I like, I genuinely will, will be buying more of this. It's, it's, uh, it's really, really good. So I, I appreciate your time and, and the information you've provided. Well, thank you. You're great. This is fun. Easy, you're easy to talk to. <laughs> Perfect. That's what we're going for. <laughs> 
Awesome. Thanks, Colby. All right. Thank you.